Thank you, Sarah, for that great introduction um, to tonight's session. Well, tonight for us, but probably in the afternoon or the morning for some of you in Europe and in, uh, in the new world. Um, my name is Ding Li, and I work as BirdLife's Flyways Coordinator here in Asia. I'm based in Singapore, and I work very closely with a lot of our uh, BirdLife partners here in Southeast Asia, uh, working closely with our colleagues to develop projects for migratory birds, uh, developing policies, and also sometimes once in a blue moon, I get a chance to get, travel to the ground to do a bit of field work and uh, work alongside our partners to protect migratory shorebirds. Uh, today, I have with me a uh, a distinguished cast from our BirdLife partnership here in Southeast Asia. And I'm pleased to let you know that I'll be joined by Thierry Dewi Ong coming in from Myanmar. Uh, Thierry uh, has taken uh, the time to join us despite a lot of the challenges that she's uh, facing, you know, in terms of getting uh, stable internet and electricity. So thank you very much, Thierry, for making your time available to us here on tonight's um, webinar. Uh, from Thailand, I'm joined by, joined by uh, Kwan Kao Sinhaseni, and she is the director of the Bird Conservation Society of Thailand. And I forgot to mention that Thierry is the executive director of Banker, our partner in Myanmar. So I've got two directors with me here telling us a little bit more about the work that they're doing in their respective countries. Uh, unfortunately, my colleague, uh, Mr. Uh, Le Chong Chai from Vietnam, he's unable to join us tonight due to some unforeseen circumstances um, in Vietnam. But he's kindly given me the permission to present on his behalf. Uh, Chai is the Deputy Director of Viet Nature Conservation Centre, our partner in Vietnam, uh, and has worked a lot on birds and uh, ornithology in Southeast Asia. So some of you might even know of his work. So um, a very exciting night for, for us here to, today to hear about uh, the the work that uh, BirdLife partners are doing on the ground in, in Southeast Asia. Now, for a start, I just wanted to uh, give everybody on today's webinar a bit of background and context about the work that we are doing for migratory bird conservation, really to set the stage so that you can get a little bit uh, of understanding of some of our conservation priorities, uh, what we plan to do next, and some of our supporters who have been you know, diligently um, ensuring us that we have the resources to do the work we want to do on the ground to protect migratory birds. And then once that is done, I'll hand the floor over to Thierry, to uh, Kwan Kao, and then to try, actually spoken by myself, on the work that is being done in Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam, respectively. So I'm just going to do a quick share screen, and you should be able to see my slides on your screens very shortly. So... Um, just to give you a little bit of background on the work that we do here uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, as many of you here would have known, uh, Southeast Asia lies along the East Asian Australasian Flyway, which uh, many of us have read from various papers and articles that uh, this is among the world's most threatened migratory flyway for birds. Most of the world's migratory species um, that are in danger of extinction are found in this flyway. So this is a flyway of exceptional conservation priority for the BirdLife partnership to work on. Um, through BirdLife, we have developed a um, complex but uh, a very prioritized program of work to allow us to deliver uh, activities and action on the ground. And this is done through our Global Flyways program, uh, which works on a number of uh, key conservation priorities. Uh, for example, identifying the most important sites for migratory birds, making sure that the policies are in place to protect migratory birds, ensuring that the science is there, you know, for us to figure out what are our priorities going forward to protect some of these threatened species. And also, uh, most importantly, to create mechanisms for people to work together across um, international uh, contexts. So the Flyways program is a very important tool for the BirdLife partnership and also our, our colleagues from other NGOs and conservation organizations to work together to collaborate um, and to deliver the kinds of international cooperation that we need to protect migratory species in this part of the world. Um, through a lot of consultation that we've done with our partners across Asia, uh, in total 13 partners uh, talking to our colleagues in anywhere between Japan, Korea, um, Hong Kong, various Southeast Asian countries, and also in Australia and New Zealand. Um, in recent years, we have launched the East Asian Australasian Flyway Strategy, which basically outlines 
the priorities that we want to focus our resources and attention on for migratory species here in Southeast Asia. And hopefully this, this document would be a living document which constantly would absorb feedback coming from the ground as to how we can fine tune and improve our actions uh, to save migratory species here in the East Asian Australasian Flyway um, at the flyway level, at the national level, and across issues that are shared by, by countries in this part of the world. Um, and this is just a quick snapshot of where we are working on the ground. We work in many countries in this flyway uh, and oftentimes working very closely with local communities to ensure that some of the most important wetlands that are used by some of the most threatened migratory species here in Asia are well protected um, in the long term, while also ensuring that people um, in this part of the world and living close to these wetlands have an opportunity to uh, sustainable livelihoods. So just a really quick snapshot on some of the actions that we are doing on the ground in different parts of the East Asian Australasian flyway. Uh, what are our conservation priorities here in Asia? You, some of you might ask. Um, I, I like to spend more time talking about this, but I'm mindful of um, you know, the limitations that we have today. So I'll just give you a really quick run through on our conservation priorities for migratory species in the EAAF. Now, in a nutshell, uh, there are five key priorities that uh, we like to think of uh, as, you know, the most important uh, pieces of action for migratory birds in this flyway. Uh, first and foremost, coastal wetlands are a top, top priority for us at BirdLife. And we all know why, because coastal wetlands are so vulnerable to development. And yet at the same time, these wetlands are also among the most important sites for migratory species, including species that we all know very well, like the spoonbill sandpiper. So coastal wetlands are extremely important uh, part of bird life's priority uh, for bird conservation migratory bird conservation in, in this part of the world. Uh, but not to be forgotten is also our work uh, to address hunting issues. Uh, hunting issues are widespread uh, threats to migratory birds in Southeast Asia and also elsewhere in Asia. And it is a, a very big priority for us. We are now working closely with all our partners on the ground to better understand the situation uh, of uh, bird hunting in various countries and to figure out what are the most important actions that we need to bring forward to protect birds from you know, being taken in illegal settings or in unsustainable settings. Many of you are probably also aware of the uh, recent increase in um, energy installations around the region. Uh, we see that all across Asia and elsewhere in the world, there's an increase in you know wind installations, solar installations. And we think that while this is very important to allow us to transition into a sustainable uh, 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 forms of energy, we think that it's also very important for us to ensure that this energy transition is uh, working for biodiversity conservation. So we are working very closely with several partners right now to figure out what are the most sensitive landscapes for migratory bird conservation that we should try to avoid or mitigate the impacts of energy installations. And of course, not to be forgotten, uh, also our work on freshwater wetlands, a very important theme for uh, bird conservation here in Southeast Asia. Many of you would know that Southeast Asia and Indo-Burma in particular falls right in the region where we call the Mekong Flat Plains. So the Mekong Flat Plains is a very densely populated part of Southeast Asia, but it's also an, uh, a part of this region that is used by so many different species of migratory birds, especially flagships like the Saras crane. So this is a, a big priority for us and we are working very closely on the ground, again, with our colleagues in Cambodia, in Thailand, to make sure that some of the most important freshwater wetlands are protected for these species. And last but not least, we are also trying to expand our work to protect land birds. Uh, land birds are often not thought of because they tend to be small um, and often um, inconspicuous species, but we are trying to uh, strengthen our actions on land birds to promote more awareness of land birds and uh, also to build a scientific base on understanding which are the land bird species that are most under threat from development and other, other threats here in, in Asia. Uh, the way we work, we work very closely with a coalition of organizations in this part of the world, some of which are very familiar to the audience here. Uh, we work very closely with the Convention on Migratory Species in Bonn uh, to align our priorities. But here in Asia, we also work very, very closely with the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership, uh, a leading organization uh, that is that is effectively bringing together governments, NGOs, and the private sector to mobilize resources for protecting some of our most threatened migratory birds. Uh, 
And I would like to particularly single out the efforts of the Spoon Built Sandpiper Task Force. It's a task force under the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership. We work very closely with the task force to ensure that the most important conservation priorities and actions for the spoon built sandpiper are carefully delivered on the ground across the flyway for this species. But of course, that is not all. We also work with a number of other working groups under the EAAFP. For instance, the Blackface Spoonbill Working Group, the Bayer's Pochart Task Force, uh, the working group to address illegal hunting here in Asia, uh, as well as our friends in the Shorebird Working Group. Uh, in bird life, uh, we believe in international cooperation and we want this to reflect close uh you know the, the the vision that we have for migratory bird conservation so in recent years we have set up a uh, internal team basically bringing together people from different parts of the bird life partnership in this part of the region uh, to work more closely together and to share experiences and develop um, programs and activities to train other interested bird life partner to deliver conservation actions for migratory birds um, in the region um, before I conclude my presentation, I thought it would be good and timely for me to just quickly share uh, uh, a, a few bits of snippets on some of the work that we have done for coastal wetlands in Southeast Asia. And I know that our colleagues um, in Banker, in BCST, will tell you the full story later. But just to give you a, a little bit of flavor of what you can expect to hear uh, very shortly. So. Uh, Obviously, and I've mentioned this several times in my presentation, Southeast Asia is a very important part of uh, our priorities for migratory bird conservation. And we work very closely on the ground with our partners in Myanmar, in Thailand, in Vietnam, and in Cambodia, focusing on a bunch of uh, high priority conservation species such as the spoonbill sandpiper, the spotted green shank, and the black faced spoonbill. Uh, some of you may have read that in recent years, uh, our partner the, uh, in Thailand has set up the first ever um, private conservation area uh, for threatened shorebirds in the Gulf of Thailand, the Park Thale Nature Reserve. So for those of you who get a chance to, to visit Southeast Asia, do pop by and to see some of these exciting work that is being done by our Thai partner. Um, and of course, um, there's also lots of interesting updates that we have got from Myanmar and Vietnam as well. Uh, in Vietnam, we are working very closely with our partner, um, which it, who, they are based in North Vietnam, in Hanoi, uh, to understand the situation of illegal bird hunting. Uh, so we've run lots of field surveys and lots of meetings with government, right, to get an understanding of the situation of illegal hunting and how we can work better with the Vietnam government to ensure that, you know, um, hunting of birds is well addressed uh, going forward. So lots of lots of important updates coming from the region in relation to bird hunting, um, especially in uh, again Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam, as well as Cambodia, Malaysia, and and Laos. Yeah, um, there's lots of um, engagements that we have with uh, governments across the region, uh, as you can see in my current slide. Um, I know a lot of this conservation work that you are seeing happen, you know, in a very um, behind the scenes kind of way, but they are very important because it is through a lot of these conversations that we have with our government colleagues that uh, we eventually agree on what are the most important actions on the ground, where should we deliver enforcement and how should we make that happen. So um, I want to uh, flag some of these important engagements that our partners in Myanmar, Banker, uh, have with uh, the Myanmar government uh, to flag the issue of um, illegal hunting, unsustainable hunting in various parts of the country, um, as well as uh, our, some of our colleagues working closely with our Vietnam partner in Vietnam to uh, you know understand the situation of bird hunting better in various parts of southern Vietnam, northern Vietnam, and beyond. Um, here's a one nice picture that we recently. Uh, took from a, a workshop that we concluded just a couple of months back in North Vietnam, where we work very closely with the management team of two protected areas, two of the most important wetland sites, in fact, in Northern Vietnam, to help them build capacity for enforcement and migratory bird conservation. Um, so uh, before I conclude, I just want to do a quick shout out to all our supporters across um, the region, especially some of our donors who have been very diligently 
helping us to uh, mobilize the, res the resources that we need to make sure that these projects run on the ground. In particular, I'd like to flag uh, Zeiss, who has been very supportive of our work on migratory shorebirds. They have also been species champion for the spotted green shank. Uh, I would like to also mention the work of the uh, Mohamed bin Zayed Conservation Fund, the International Conservation Fund of Canada, the Oriental Bird Club, the Climate Fund Manager, many other donors who um, I, I, I can't cover uh, all today. Uh, but I cannot also um, overlook the work of our colleagues at the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership, especially the Spoonbill Sandpiper Task Force. And of course, last but not least, our, our colleagues who we work very closely with in the governments of various Southeast Asian countries, especially in Thailand, Vietnam and in Cambodia. So I think that brings me <laughs> to the end of uh, my little introductory presentation. And uh, I would like to now pass the floor to our next presenter, uh, Thierry Dewi Ong from uh, Banker, Director of our BirdLife uh, Partner in Myanmar. Um, for, Thierry's, for Thierry's part, um, I just want to quickly introduce her as well. I don't think I've gone through so much details on that earlier on. Thierry is the Executive Director of Banker. Uh, she is a um, she's a very seasoned ornithologist and has worked for many years uh, to better understand the ecology and conservation of migratory waterbirds in various parts of Myanmar, from the plains of the Irrawaddy River in central Myanmar to the coasts of uh, central South Myanmar, where the Spoonbill Sandpiper lives. So she has been working very closely with her teams on the ground to ensure that conservation actions for species such as the Bayer's Pochard and the Spoonbill Sandpiper are well delivered on the ground and in close coordination with the authorities and with local communities. Um, because Thierry is, uh, uh, may face some of these uh, challenges from Wi-Fi and electric uh, uh, disruptions, what I will do for her is that I will run a pre-recorded presentation. Um, and uh, for the benefit of our audience, I would like to encourage you to turn up your volumes a little bit, just in case it's a bit soft for you. So I will stop sharing now and uh, run into Thierry's presentation. Firstly, I would like to talk about the banker. What, the, we, what we have uh, started the biodiversity conservation in Myanmar. Bangor was established in 2002 and has been beginning the biodiversity conservation. Now nearly 20 years and you live in Myanmar. We strive to make a positive impact on nature biodiversity as well as on the communities. In order to get our strategic goal, we define three things. Conservation of globally threatened species and their habitat, that is one of our themes, and partnership with NGO, INGO, government, and other institutes and local communities. We all consider our institution as struggling for the long-term conservation in Myanmar. You can see the Environmental Educational Sustainability Center. It has been built in the Mon State, especially for the shorebirds and coastal wetland at the Gulf of Modemar. We work with the variety of the partner government, both national and international organization as a partner. We make a partner with uh, not only the organization, but also working with the local communities by forming the local conservation group and the community-based organization. There were 18 local conservation groups in Myanmar were established and these groups are being supported by the Bangor. Bangor is the fully partnership of the Wildlife International as a bird and nature conservation partnership in Myanmar since 2017. We have been working together with them in conservation for the sustainable biodiversity in nature. In terms of conservation of the Spondyl Sandpiper, Spondyl Sandpiper and other migratory shorebird species are mainly in four key areas, Nanta Island, Nemila Wildlife Sanctuary, Gulf of Motama, and the Taninlai Coastal Area. The Taninlai Coastal Area is the only one out of the protecting system. These three areas, the Nanta Island, Nemila Wildlife Sanctuary, and Gulf of Motama, all of these are the run sites, and the Nanda Island is the Marine National Park, and the Mimila Wildlife Sanctuary is the Wildlife Sanctuary, and these two are managed by the Forest Department. All of these areas are sandy mufflet, and thousands of migratory shorebird species are regularly visited in wintry season. We are working conservation mainly for the spawnbill sandpiper, the spotted green shan, and gray nods at the Gulf of Modema and Nanta Island. This is showed that what we are working for the conservation of spawnbill sandpiper in the Gulf of Modema. The Gulf of Modema is hosting the 30% of the global wintering spawnbill sandpiper. The Gulf is the final rule 
ecosystem that it support thousands of the household livelihood to local communities and up to 150,000 migratory water species, including up to half the global population of the critically and dangerous Pondo sun fiber. Therefore, we are working for four areas, safe species, site and habitat conservation, empowerment local people for positive changes in conservation and encourage ecological sustainability at the Gulf of Modama. Since 2008, Bangar has collaborated with the local communities on wetland and spawned sandpiper conservation, including engaging the bird hunter and developing local livelihood with partner organizations. Bangar also has a strong track record in establishing the local conservation group who are bird hunters in Ali. Now they have begun the community conservation group by supporting their livelihood. Bangar has been supporting the capacity building fee monitoring of shore birds and awareness and on ground smart patrolling by following the wetland management plan and SIPA manual by the government for sustainable use of the coastal natural resource and biodiversity conservation. We have been coordinating with the relevant stakeholder local and national governments, partner organizations and local communities in governance of the coastal management and enhancing awareness raising the value of GAFO Modumat in all levels. Bangor began addressing the hunting threats to this species with support from the Rice Society for Protection of Birds (RSPB) in 2020, in the coordination with the Spunville Sandpiper Tax Force to achieve the conservation and sustainable use of their tidal flood, at the same time as improving their livelihood. We supported the alternative livelihood to the local bar hunter, and now they have become the local partner in the Spunville Sandpiper conservation. We support boat and the motorbike for their smart patrolling at the Gulf of Motama. This conservation work has been successful and Bangor supported establishment of the Gulf of Motama as a Ramsar site in one state. Where the main population of Spawnville Sandpiper has been recorded. To reach our goal, we strive collaboration with the local communities and have been providing the training based on their need assessment and the work together with them by raising the capacity and empowerment. There are eight local conservation groups in the eastern side of Motoma and totally 45 members, including three women as a member. So we work together with the local conservation group at the area of monitoring on the shore species and the SIPA walk, education awareness in the in the school children in at the at the eastern side of the Gafo Modumba. Not only the monitorings of the Spandle Sandpiper and Shubert species and the Sipa walk in the, the gut of Modumba, but also we make a planning of the community-based natural resource management by leading the local conservation group. We Bangal continues the stakeholder engaging the mainstream means on the conservation of the key wetland area, the Formodomar and Nanda Islands. The Nanda Island is another area for the Spandrel Sandpiper and we engage for the designation of Ramsar Site and, and Marine National Park. Due to the hard work of more than 10 years in the Gulf of Modumar. It is residing in the area designated as the flywheel site in 2017. In 2018, the Gulf of Modumar became the fourth area uh, Ramsar site in Myanmar, covering the 42,000 hectare of the coastline of the Moor State on the eastern side of the Gulf. In 2020, the area was extended to 161,000 hectare, including the coast of the Papua region, west of the Gulf of Modumar, and southern Moor State. During the difficult time of the COVID-19 and politics problem in our country, we have monitored the national action plan of Spondyl Sandpiper and a lot of the work for the CPAR. Public, like the publication of CPAR handbook for the Gulf of Moduma, CPAR TOD training to the local communities and community-based organization, and orientation to the Gulf of Moduma project staff, and training to the community-based organization in both sides was an ease of the Gulf of Motuma. The training and orientation were undertaken regularly by using the IC materials to inspire the participants. 
In the meantime, we produce the IC materials target for the 4,000 audience for the Bagol region. Unfortunately, we could not be able to do this awareness talk and SIPA work in the villages of the Bagul region. We conduct also the smart patrolling in the Mon state, east of the Gafo Motoma, the patrolling training, lecturer online, and uh, we made a co coaching together with the, the local conservation group at the, at the Mon state. Uh, we make a standing sideboard for the conservation of the wetland and the, the spawnbill sandpiper conservations and awareness of the Ramsar site. And we also distributed the pamphlet for about the wetland ecosystem service and the climate change impact on the wet coastal wetlands. And we make and also we make a recording video for about the biodiversity conservation, biodiversity conservation law, waste management, about SIPA, mangrove conservation. All of these are distributed to the local communities. Observation of the spondyl sandpiper have declined since 2010 and continued in recent year. For this year, we record the population is slowed down and declining. We found that the, the population is uh, declining and Gafo Motoma holds about the 20 to 30 percent of the global spawnbill sandpiper population. Hunting remains the key threat to the spawnbill sandpiper that leads to urgent action to reduce the impact on the world population. Other conservation actions since 2009 have led to be the sharp drop in hunting. The small level of hunting could have a very serious impact on the small spawnbill sandpiper population. Due to the situation of politics and the healthy issue in Myanmar, villagers are struggling economically and there are reports of war crunching and selling at the local market and the Buddha. Illegal and unsustainable hunting is the immediate and severe threat to vibrant population in Myanmar. Poor law enforcement in the Gafo Modama stay active for illegal fishing and craft having activity in the Gafo Modama. Lack of Ramsarside sideboard is there and it is the one of the important for the long term management of the ecology of the Gaffa Motoma. Patrolling effort have been done based on the availability of the financial resource and also the data gap of the market assessment, particularly on the park hunting. The last one is the plastic pollution. It has been causing at the edge of the village and coastline at the Gaffa of Motoma. The population may affect the population of fishes and the Showbirds by the indirectly. In the future, we will be working with the conservation of the Gafo Motoma by making the partner with the Habitat Myanmar, which has been implementing the major assist government stuff, uh, government funded projects around the Gafo Motoma to support the local livelihood and sustainable management of the Gaf of Motoma. So, mainly it will be the capacity building of the governance committee, depending on the cluster and working groups. They are included in the framework of the governance structure, but the west of the Gafo Motoma is still lack of the conservation activities. The Spondyl Sandpiper is the long-term priority species for our conservation work. Bangor has already developed the Spondyl Sandpiper Mission Action Plan for the period of the 2021 to 2023 to guide our engagement with our stakeholders and deliver on conservation activities focused on these species. We will implement this conservation activity in accordance with the action plan of the Spondyl Sandpiper. So we believe that we have a responsible for the Spondyl Sandpiper and biodiversity conservation at the Gulf of Motoma. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer if you have any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was a, an excellent presentation uh, by Thierry um, and really appreciate that you, uh, you know, took the trouble to join us on the webinar despite some of the challenges that you're facing. Um, it's also very clear uh, from your plan that there's lots of exciting uh, work that you're planning going forward, you know, to protect the Spoonbill Sandpiper. So well done on that. Um, and I think there were a few very clear messages for the audience that, uh, you know, at least for the case of Myanmar, there's, a, there's obviously a very urgent need, you know, for us to, to work closely and to build these relationships with local communities uh, because they are the people living on the site. They work on the site, they live on the site and it's important to get them engaged in the conservation 
uh, of those sites, uh, like uh, you know the wetlands that we have here in the Gulf of Motama, uh, to ensure that these wetlands are, are better protected and has that support from from local stakeholders. So thank you once again, Thierry, for this excellent presentation. Um, and and moving on to our next presentation, we are we're just going to move from uh, literally from west to east, right? From Myanmar, I'm moving across to Thailand, and in Thailand, I'm joined I'm joined by uh, Kwan Kao Sin Han Seni. She is the director of uh, the Bird Conservation Society of Thailand, our partner in Thailand, and um, she works very, very closely with her team uh, to protect a number of wetland sites in, in the country. Uh, but most famously to many of us here, the Park Thale Nature Reserve, which is perhaps, uh, well, at least in my view, uh, one of the most accessible sites to see so many of these threatened migratory water bird species here in Southeast Asia. Uh, I think uh, I should leave... Uh, uh, Kim Im, as Kwan Kao calls herself, to tell us more about the story uh, uh, of some of the projects that she's been doing on the ground. Um, over to you, Kim Im. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ding Li, for such a nice introduction. And anyway, I would like to welcome everyone to Park Tele. So I'm sure that everyone still surprisingly spare is Park Tele, but maybe half of you already know that because in another term, people call this is the heaven of the birder around the world. But now I would like to share you the story, how this lovely place happened. And let's start from that place. I can say Dingli already touched about the flyway and I just want to be a little bit specific because I know some of you maybe just join now and we are in the East uh, Asian Australian flyway but you can see Thailand also be a part of this this lovely route and the to be more specific is especially in this site in Patle, that in February in the Gao of Thailand, we can say that this is a kind of the key site of the migratory shorebird. So that's why we thought this is quite a very important process, especially in Thailand, that we should make some movement and action. So that's why this from starting point, we also have our lovely team work so hard in the field, monitor the birds since about 2000s. And we found this lovely guy, I think you already heard something about this spoonbill sandpiper or in short that we call spoonie. So that's why we know like this area is quite important. And another part of that we know they still have a plenty of migratory shorebird visit this place. And apart from that, another site, of the story is this is also very important in terms of the traditional practice that we call Sopan practice. I can say around this region, we not really have this kind of practice left anymore. And in one way, this practice very eco-friendly for our lovely bird. That's why come up to Patele is become a key site. That's why we want to protect the bird. And we also try to generate benefit for the local people as well. And you can see from this photo, it's quite start from the lovely story because we know Park Chile is important, but how we can protect this place because the price of the salt is always up and down. That mean make some local people not really feel that secure about this production. So this is, we found like it's a kind of the critical issue, but in one way, this is also a challenge for us that we should take this opportunity by purchase this land and we can find out like one of the saw pan is on sale. So that's why we thought this is going to be a great if we decide to purchase this land. And also we got a plenty of support from the Rainforest Trust and also many public crowdfunding, both in Thailand and also from the overseas. In the end, we can make this happen. We got the land is about eight hectares and it looked like a lovely night for me. But this one even look very thin and tiny, but it's become a great and impactful site as well. Let me go through more detail about this site. I mentioned before about the salt pan, but I'm sure some of you, if you come from another part of the world, you not really understand much what is the salt pan. So that's why I would like to give you a little bit background. How is this salt pan work? The salt pan is mean like we try to direct some water from the sea or from the ocean to different points, and then we use the solar energy to evaporate that until the salt is firm and we collect that. 
So that means like for this process, we not really use any kind of the chemical. That means we use this way is more eco-friendly practice. But anyway, it also need a lot of effort and need a plenty of plan. But for this practice, it provide a lovely place for many birds for roosting and for ranking in the site, especially for the migratory shore bird. So that's why we know this has become a key area. And then what we can do, we know there are many birders that they would like to do the bird observation, taking a photo. So we decide to construct the bird hide. And in the end, we got this lovely hut. This lovely hut is very suitable for many people if you want to do the bird watching. Apart from that, we thought this is one way of the communication about bird conservation. We put a lovely side of many shore birds that you can see here. So people will see this place, they can look at the bird, and we also try to educate them in some way to know more about the bird as well. So in general, I can say we have a good start. We know this is a key site. But anyway, we know we try to make some action to make this land happen. So one way we know if you want to do it, in long term, the salt pan is a kind of the big system. We have to do the habitat management. And one of the activity that we have to keep in mind is about the water management. You can see this is a kind of the empty salt pan. And also this is quite a different pond. The thing that we try to do is like we direct water into different pond, but this is a huge area. That means we have to work with the local community to manage this system. And I can say in one way, we make this happen. It means we still maintain this lovely pond and we turn this, the empty one of the salt pond to become the semi-natural in salt mud flat. And this salt is quite good enough in terms of the physical, but we not really know the function yet. If you really want to know the result, how it's worked for this, just wait a bit. Next thing that I want to share with you, so everything that we do, very optimistic. We have a lovely area, we manage by ourselves, but we're not that lucky. Because the place that we purchase also have a big effect from the coastal erosion. That's why we try to find some way to protect our place. Then we work with the government and we provide the bamboo fence along the coastal line to prevent our place. But anyway, life is not that easy. We still have some problem about the coastal erosion every year as well. And we still try to find, to figure out what is the great technique that we can prevent this one. All right, now we set the place up. We have a lovely bird high. We know to direct the water. We try to prevent our places from the coastal erosion. But one of the main question that we really want to know is, can we attract some bird to maintain the great population in our site? And I can say for us, at least we got four or a spoon new sand pebble visit our place once a year. And from the last record for this year, we got four. Even you, you maybe think like mm, four is just a small number, but for us, this is such a wonderful one because spoon new sand pebble, the population very small, like Sarah just shared in the chat box. And I would like to say thank you to many supporters to support this Spoon Bill Sand Fiber project for OBC and ICFC as well. But now we have a new champion species that I want to promote more. Even they not look that unique, but they're very attractive as well. And this uh, species is Spot Green Chang. Or another name that people call is the Northman Green Chang. This guy, I can say like around the world, is will have around like 20,000 uh, in the middle of the population. But we found only in our place is about 100, up to 140 spot green shank this year. That's why we're so proud of that, that we can feel like we can contain these three ten species. If you look at this photo, you can see like there are many variety three ten species on our site that been recorded. I can say not man green shang is one of that. The great not also away with us and also have many things as well. I would like to sum up is mean per year we have about 10,000 shower visit us during the winter time and in total at least 
67 bird species around our Barclay site. As I say, very tiny and small, but still contain a lot of species as well. And the next thing that I want to say that is also our part of the challenging, like we want to provide a pond, but we want to know what is the kind of food that is lovely shorebird want to eat. And we find a plenty of mentors in this site. And we corroborate this work with one of the universities in Thailand. And we find out like Chinese secret. They love to eat some crab. And I also love to eat some crab too. More than that, Northman Green Shank or Spot Green Shanks, one of their preference is also about the crab as well. So one way is me. Once we know more about that, it's going to be help us a lot in terms of the habitat management and also provide some food resources. That's why this is come up to our mind. And we try to collect this background information. It's going to be great. Once we want to develop the plan to manage the site, we have enough background information. One thing that I just want to sum up is like, of course, one of the key impact that we made is we turn Abadan salt plan to become a semi-natural inland mud flat. We can maintain the diversity of the bird in our site, but how about other people who live around these sites? Do they have any benefit from that? So that's why one way we also try to work with the communities. You can see from this photo, one of the things that we try to do is we train the local people who have some interest on the bird to become a bird leader. They can get the income from this alternative way. Once they know more about the bird, they can lead the people, also support the community in terms of the ecotourism on site. Apart from that, I mentioned before, they produce the salt and how we can transform the soil to get a better price. One way, this is a lovely sparse boonbill soil. I can say this is very cute and also make some people that they want to get some unique souvenir or the product contact us as well. But anyway, I can say this is on the process that we try to develop community owned products, but everything takes time as well. But one thing that I would like to emphasize Normally, sometimes when we try to work with a community leader, it's only a man, but the great combination on our side is we take a role of many women in the group that they want to take the action and they're also concerned more about the conservation. I can say this is also a great achievement on that as well. And another part, we also try to work with other universities on site because I know there will be a leader to make a move especially in Petbury province. That's why we work with the Petbury, uh, Rajapat Petbury universities, and they're really interested about to do campaign related about Bachele. The thing that they try to do, they just to sit aside and do the check-in and try to post something on the social media. Even this is just a small movement. I can say like, this is a great achievement because last year, people from Petbury and also around Thailand, visit and check in in this place more than a hundred times. Even we have a travel restriction, that's why we think more about the domestic traveling as well. Another thing that is be a part of our key vision is we get good information. We try to do some movement, but another thing that we try to do is about the communication. So that's why we have some campaigns and always promote something related about the spoon dew sand pipes and also about the Northman Green Shank. And the Northman Green Shank, we get a great support from the crowd size and MDSA to make this project happen because this is quite a new species that I can say in general from the birder communities, you guys know this species, but in terms of public cities, this is quite new. So that's why crowd size is help us a lot to make the movement and also MDSAT to support this project. And at least now we get the best line data of the Northman Green Chain. And then we try to promote about this species at the moment. Moreover, we know like communication is a part of the key success. After we learn from many partners around bird life and also in Southeast Asia, that's why we develop the youth camp. This one, especially for the communication, and we get the lovely expert from different field. They will support our youth group to produce the best product. And some of the product is become a short video. Some of the product is about a photo galleries. 
And the last one is about the journal. I can say, in general, when people want to communicate about the wildlife conservation, rarely people try to communicate about shorebird because in terms of the color, sound is not that attractive. But this group of the people make something change because most of them not really have much background on the shorebird conservation before. They are a type of new generation around the high school and the university time. And then they want to explore new things. That's why they decide to join our program. For this program, once we announce that more than a hundred people apply to us, but we can select only eight people to join. I mean, I, I should say eight team of that, but in total it's about 20. So that's why we just realized now this kind of stuff is on demand. And also we try to find a way that connect people with the new generation and with the conservation project as well. Last and not least, I can say, even we work with communities, we try to work with the new and young generation. But the thing that we cannot miss is work with the government. In Thailand, the taking part and the lead role, especially around this area, is the Department of the Marine and Coastal Resources. So that's why, in short, we call them the MCR. We decide to work closely with them, and we also set up the local committee to create the management plan for the park play and the petri provinces. Lucky us, we can make this happen. That's why we got another extra area. If you remember from my first slide, I hope this thing nice. But now we got another support from the DMCR because they realize shorebird conservation is very important. That's why we expand from just this lovely site only seven hectare and they provide another 21 hectare of the area to connect between this size and this gonna be an education center for the shorebird conservation. In general, I just want to say, now we prepare the site, we monitor the bird and we try to do some collaboration, but we have a bigger plan. The thing that we try to do, we want to make this place become the education center. And this one, of course, is will include about migratory shorebird, it's about the mangrove, and also related about the traditional salt pan practice. And we expect we can do the co-management with the communities. Apart from that, we plan to have the interactive learning material, and I can show you a little bit more later. So. We also want to empower the local communities to have their own products and make their products become even better qualities. That's why they have their own soap, they have their own salt, but the thing that we try to help them is promote the product and try to make the packaging even better because they can be competitive with other products around the region. But on top of that, they have a great story to protect the shorebird conservation as well. So this is gonna be a great product with the lovely story. Apart from that, we still try to do the habitat management. I cannot say we do the best yet. We still learn from the thing that we keep practice. This is a kind of the adaptive management, even about the water management and also about the coastal erosion prevention. That's why we are gonna launch the new campaign even your small hand can make things better. And this one, we have a plan about like, you donate just one US dollar, you will support one meter of the bamboo fence. That's mean, even you are ordinary people, you want to protect the shorebird, you still can have any chance to be a part of us. And if you want to do it now, you can scan this QR code and you can support us as well. But anyway, I just want to say like, sometimes we rely on the big funder or the big grant, but in one way, we still ask ordinary people who really want or willing to do something with us to donate and make some movement together. And last but not least, we still try to keep continue to do the research on different aspects as well. One direction that we try to do, we still try to have a great data system about the technique of the water management and also the level of the pond what is the preference for each bird species? Another part of that, we know we have part clay, but how this part clay can generate the 
income. We would like to turn this one to economic value in terms of the protection for the communities and the shoreboard conservation. The last one. Anyway, one of the great things that we have is like we continue to collect the data since 2000. And now we still want to keep collect the data in long term for the shorebird, both is it on site and also migratory shorebird as well. And in the end, we would like this place can be a great education center that people can visit us. As Stingley mentioned before, this is quite one of the easy place that people who want to see variety of the bird and the rare species just pop up on site and you can see everything. Now, I think I promote a lot about the site and I'm really sure like one day, probably I can welcome everyone to Park Chile and you can see how diverse of bird, how great of the community who work with us. And also we hope the thing that we try to do, even the small action can make a big impact to connect to the flyway. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic presentation by Kim Im, um, and also a, a very comprehensive introduction to um, the, the very um, you know uh, long term work that is being planned for Park Tale uh, Wetland Reserve, which I think uh, Kim Im and I would agree. Um, I've been lucky to visit the site several times to be one of the finest, if not the finest site to see shorebirds easily in all of Southeast Asia. So uh, for those of you who want to know a little bit more about the work that is being done and uh, see the conditions on the ground and how alternative livelihoods uh, through you know traditional salt production and ecotourism uh, is changing the life of local people, please do uh, visit. Thank you very much for that enlightening presentation once again. Um, and on that note, uh, I'd like to uh, bring the audience to our final presentation for today. Uh, this presentation will be delivered by myself on behalf of uh, Mr. Le Tong Chai, who is the um, Deputy Director of Viet Nature Conservation Centre, uh, our partner in Vietnam. Uh, many of you may already know the work of uh, Chai, as we fondly call him. Uh, Chai has been working as an ornithologist for more than three decades, and he worked closely in bird life uh, when we had a uh, program in Indochina um, and ensured that a lot of these activities were transferred onward as you know bird life into uh, Indochina program became a Viet nature uh, in Vietnam um, some of you who are bird watchers you might know that he was also behind the description and discovery of some of uh, Vietnam's most threatened endemic species some of these laughing thrushes that we have in the mountains of Vietnam were described by Tri and his colleagues uh, 20 30 years ago so I'm just going to quickly take us through some of the work uh, that Tri and his team does at Viet Nature Conservation Center for Migratory Birds. And w once again, I'll share uh, my slides with you. Now, let me just bring you into a very quick introduction of the work of uh, the Viet Nature Conservation Center uh, based in Hanoi in northern Vietnam. So Viet Nature um, has a proud history of having been bird lives Vietnam program back in the days. Uh, they were working on the ground, you know, more than 25 years ago uh, to basically develop uh, and invent various inventories to understand where are the most important sites for birds in Vietnam. Um, Viet Nature has been behind some very instrumental work, for example, some of you who follow conservation in Indochina, you would know that uh, Viet Nature has uh, worked very hard 20-30 uh, years ago to identify all these key sites for birds across the country. Um, and of course, many of these key sites uh, we call important bird and biodiversity areas have now transitioned to become uh, protected areas, you know, protected at the national level or even at the provincial level. Uh, Viet Nature has got a long track record in, you know, ornithology in Vietnam. Um, they've discovered numerous species of birds, some new to science, many new to the country. And as I mentioned earlier on, when I was introducing our speaker, Tri, um, many endemic species of birds um, that are now limited to very few areas of mountain forests in central and southern Vietnam. So Fiat Nature has really been that technical authority, you know, on bird conservation um, and protected area establishment in Vietnam. And of course, working very closely with their partners in central Vietnam, in South Vietnam, and of course, the various agencies of the, of the Vietnam government. Um, I just want to quickly run you through some of the priority conservation activities of 
Viet Nature uh, to give you a sense of where uh, are the most important actions for them in terms of bird conservation in Vietnam. And as you can see from the map, uh, because of Viet Nature's uh, location you know in this the capital city of hanoi uh, obviously a lot of the conservation projects that they are running on the ground happen in northern vietnam and central vietnam especially the provinces between tan hoa and quang tri in the north central region of vietnam but of course also not to be forgotten are some of these very important wetlands in northern vietnam uh, as you can see uh, on the top uh, right hand side of the slide, one of these very important wetlands that Viet Nature had played a huge role in identifying more than 10 years ago, you know, and now ha recently have matured to become a protected area is the is the wetlands of Thai Bin province uh, that you're seeing here from this aerial photograph. Uh, Viet Nature also worked very closely with our partners and colleagues in southern Vietnam, especially uh, our colleagues at the Viet uh, Vietnam National University to set up uh, work to protect shorebirds in the Mekong Delta region of Vietnam. Uh, many of us would know that the Mekong Delta is one of the most important, I would call them, coastscapes for, you know, shorebird shorebird conservation. And uh, there are cu currently uh, two or three projects happening as we speak to to uh, basically get a better sense of where these most important shorebird sites are on the Mekong Delta and how we can better engage with local communities on the Delta to get them interested in, uh, in, in migratory bird conservation. I just want to also quickly run through some of these target species and target outcome uh, very, very quickly because I am mindful that we are also running a little short on time. Uh, just to give you a quick sense of some of the species priorities of Viet Nature, you can see that Viet Nature obviously work uh, on not just birds, they also work very closely to protect some of Vietnam's most threatened mammals and reptile species on top of you know, migratory bird species and some of these really charismatic species in the mountain forests of the uh, Anamites. For example, many of you may have heard of the Edwards pheasant and the Crested Argus pheasant, some very mythical birds that many bird watchers would never get a chance to see. Um, I think there are two, two major prongs of work that Viet Nature tries to do. Um, and obviously, uh, as we can see here, uh, lowland forest protection is a, is a big part of Viet Nature's uh, conservation priorities. Some of you may have read about the work that Viet Nature is doing in Ken Luk Chuang uh, in one of the last remaining uh, significant pieces of lowland forest. So there's lots of Viet high, high mountain forests left in the mountains of Vietnam, but lowland forests are now increasingly scarce. And Viet Nature is working with provincial government authorities and the central government of Vietnam to secure some of these most important forest sites. But of course, not to be forgotten is Viet Nature's efforts, you know, to identify the most important wetlands on two regions of Vietnam, in the northern parts of Vietnam, along the coasts of the Red River, uh, estuary and in southern Vietnam on the on the coast of the Mekong uh, Delta. So here, Viet Nature works very closely, as I mentioned early on, with the partners that they have on the ground to figure out what these important sites are and to provide recommendations, te technical rep recommendations to government to to better manage some of these sites, or to even uh, advocate for some of these sites to be eventually recognized as protected areas such as nature reserves and national parks. Yeah. Uh, Try particularly want to share about some of this work that he's currently doing in northern Vietnam, uh, focusing on migratory waterbird conservation. And uh, right as we speak, we have uh, two projects ongoing in northern Vietnam to better understand the coasts of North Vietnam for migratory birds. Uh, in Vietnam, coastal uh, shorebirds have typically not received a lot of attention from conservationists. Um, and only in recent years, uh, Tri's team have been working with others to you know, conduct more surveys on the ground to figure out where these important coastal wetland sites are. Uh, species such as the Spoonbill Sandpiper, which you have seen in the presentation by our colleagues from Myanmar and Thailand. We still don't know a lot about where Spoonbill Sandpipers go to in Vietnam. And only in the last two years, in fact, we've only discovered three or four new wintering sites for this species that we never knew before. So a lot of this exploratory work um, and inventoring work is very important for us to identify priority sites for the conservation of shorebird species in North Vietnam, on the Red River Delta, and on the Mekong Delta of, uh, of South Vietnam. Um, as you have seen in previous presentations, uh, wetlands are obviously in huge trouble from development, partly because they are so accessible to people and they are so low lying being near the coast. They are really the kind of places that you would like to build fish farms or you want to start a new paddy field. This would be the kind of places that, you know, um, 
uh, low line coastal land gets converted to other kinds of man made users. So, um, a, a huge threat to uh, many of Vietnam's remaining areas of coastal wetlands, especially mudflats and mangrove swamps, is due to conversion. And of course, as you know, there's uh, more and more demand for aquaculture in Southeast Asia. Uh, I, I think it's not surprising for us to see that so many of these important areas of wetlands are being turned into fish ponds, prawn ponds, and other, other forms of aquaculture production. But uh, many of you might also be aware that uh, um, in many parts of Vietnam, as is the case with many other parts of Southeast Asia, mainland Southeast Asia especially, uh, birds are being hunted often in very uh, unsustainable numbers. Um, you will have seen instances in North Vietnam, Central Vietnam and South Vietnam, you know, where bird hunting, illegal, uh, illegal hunting of some species is going on. And uh, some of our recent work with Viet Nature and other partners on the ground in Vietnam is showing that the scale of the problem of bird hunting is actually far larger than we imagined, resulting in millions of birds being taken out of the wild every year. So hunting is obviously a very important threat for us uh, to deal with in Vietnam and elsewhere in Southeast Asia. And of course, there's other broader issues that we face in you know, protecting Vietnam's wetlands. I think we all know too well that uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, law enforcement has been you know, very limited in many instances. Uh, in many cases, we don't have strong support and engagement from community, which means that we have to work, you know, like what you have seen in the cases of Thailand and Myanmar, to build these relationships with local people to get them engaged in, you know, the conservation actions that we want to deliver for these sites. And of course, last but not least, and again, a, a perennial issue with conservation in Southeast Asia is that uh, in many instances, we just lack the evidence base to know what species is found where. So there's a lot of work for us to do, you know, to pick up the pieces to figure out what are the most important wetland sites for spoonbill sandpipers, for spotted green shank, for black-faced spoonbill and other threatened uh, shorebirds and waterbirds in, in the region. Um, in recent months, in fact, uh, Viet Nature has been leading a series of very um, focused surveys on the northern coast of Vietnam. Uh, some of you would know uh, very much about Xuan Tui, a very famous national park that was set up in Vietnam to protect key areas of coastal wetlands. But Xuan Tui is obviously not the only important area of wetland uh, for short migratory waterbirds we have in North Vietnam. And recent surveys from from uh, from Red, the Red River Delta northwards, you know, towards um, Haiphong City is beginning to reveal that there are actually many more of these coastal areas which have not been receiving a lot of attention from conservationists until recent times that these wetlands are also very important for shorebird protection. Um, so you could see on our map here, you've got Tai Tui, which is fortunately now protected as a, a nature reserve, but there's other important areas further north. For example, in Anhai, as you can see clearly marked on the map here, Anhai is an area that does not receive any protection. Uh, but the work of uh, Tri and Viet Nature um, and other conservationists like uh, Bao in South Vietnam has figured out that Anhai is obviously a very important site for spoonbill sandpiper conservation. Uh, while at the same time, it is being reclaimed bit by bit for infrastructural expansion. So there's an urgent need for us to, to basically put the science together and to advocate for the protection of sites such as Anhai here, um, just south of the city of Hai Phong. Um, Viet Nature has also been playing a very important role, you know, to monitor populations of waterbirds in uh, northern Vietnam. And one of these really charismatic species that we all know very well is the black-faced spoonbill. Uh, the black-faced spoonbill is uh, obviously one of the most well-known migratory waterbird species that we've got here in Southeast Asia. And uh, as you can see from the numbers uh, based on the counts by Viet Nature colleagues over the years, it shows that uh, this species is, you know, increasing gradually over time, and it's a sign that, you know, successful conservation action can translate to uh, recoveries in the population of some of these endangered waterbirds. Yeah. So, uh, fortunately for us, the black-faced spoonbills' um, most important uh, wintering sites are in northern Vietnam, and especially in Xuan Tui National Park, which is currently being monitored very closely by the Viet Nature team in collaboration with Xuan Tui's um, park management team over the last uh, decade or so. So just a very quick um, refresher on what the black face spoonbill looks like for some of you who are not familiar with this species. Um, I mentioned earlier on about the exploratory surveys that we are doing in North Vietnam with Asia, and this is obviously finding new areas that we need to figure ways to better protect and also engage local communities. 
Um, and uh, I'm really pleased to inform that some of this field work that has been done on the ground in North Vietnam has led to discovery of new sites for Spoonbill Sandpiper. So um, Anhai, as I mentioned earlier on, is one of these sites. We never knew that there were Spoonbill Sandpipers here, um, and that's because our surveys in the past were not intensive. Uh, but in recent years, the work by Try and others have figured out that this site is used by good numbers of Spoonbill Sandpiper, and of, and of course, on top of that, other threatened species of shorebirds, and that means that we need to, you know, think more closely about how we can protect this this wetland sites here. Um, of course, the spoonie is not the only uh, shorebird that is, um, you know, affected by the developments in northern Vietnam. There are other shorebirds that I want to mention, um, particularly the great knot. Uh, it's a species that come to Vietnam in very good numbers, and uh, we didn't actually even know that until recent times when surveys are beginning to show show us that there are large concentrations of great knots in both North Vietnam and in South Vietnam. Um, and before I close off my presentation uh, on the work of Viet Nature, I just want to emphasize that uh, to a very large part, um, you know, uh, conservation of some of these most important sites uh, need to have a strong support from, you know, the local government as well as from the people who run these protected areas. So uh, in the project that we're currently doing on the ground in Vietnam, what we are trying to do is really to build the capacity of the park management to make sure that uh, the rangers on the ground uh, and the other administrative staff are aware and mindful of what they are trying to protect and that they can, you know, uh, have the resources and the skills to monitor and protect threatened species here. So uh, re recently, uh, and thankfully, thanks to the lifting of some of these uh, corona restrictions in Vietnam, we're able to organize physical workshops to conduct training, training sessions for uh, park staff, uh, and especially for the staff of Thai Bin Nature Reserve, a very, very newly established protected area in North Vietnam, and also an important site for water birds, to get them to be uh, to better protect, to better uh, patrol, and to better monitor uh, water birds in their parks. So I think that is all I have to cover so uh, for, for Viet Nature's presentation. Uh, if you want to find out a little bit more about the work that Viet Nature does, you can visit the website here, which I've uh, put up on the screen, uh, as well as their Facebook site, which can you know get a sense of some of the work that is happening actively at the moment. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, I'm mindful that we might have, you know, uh, not much time left, but perhaps we could, you know, try to take a couple of questions before we close for the night. So, um, all right. So I think there's been uh, there's been a a, a a series of really good questions coming in from the Q and A, um, and let's try to see if we can take two or three questions before we we uh, conclude today's session. Uh, some of which are really really um, uh, important for us to talk about. Um, I think there is um, one question uh, from John Chin in Singapore, um, and I think this question is probably best uh, tailored for Kimim because it pertains to coastal protection. I think John has a question on coastal protection using bamboo fences, and he says he's wondering if uh, using bamboos uh, to protect um, the coast, uh, would it... Uh, would it be effective because he seems to be uh, concerned that seawater would cause the bamboo to decay faster? Um, and he's also asking whether if there might be other alternative to bamboo that you can think of. What, what, what are your thoughts on this, Kimmy? Okay, thank you so much, uh, everyone that asked about this question. This is a kind of the very challenging things. One thing that people try to do and why we decide to use the bamboo because it can be degraded and won't leave something behind. For example, one way that we try to do is just use the bamboo as a line. And sometimes we found from another experiment in Kokam area, in sense of to make it like a line, they make it look like a V-shape along the way to make things a little bit slower to effect on the coastal. That's it can be another option. And I found like from some literature, the thing that they try to do for to prevent the coastal erosion is like try to use some mangrove trees along the line. And it can be another alternative way that we try to do. So that's mean this year the end that we try is we want to try a few techniques and let's see which one is going to work well. But in this case, it's not that easy because in terms of the coastal erosion, it's quite huge area. It's effect from many factors. That's why we really try, really want to try 
but let's see how it go. But if you have a great idea, feel free to share with me. I really hear to say something, and I saw one person share it with me on the chat box. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kimim. That was a great answer. Yeah. Um, and moving quickly to the next question, I think this question I can um, pass it to Thierry. Uh, this is a question on Spoonbill Sandpiper. And there's a question coming from Gaurav uh, about uh, pollution. How, can, how, how, how is pollution affecting Spoonbill Sandpipers? And how can we reduce uh, you know, the impact of pollution uh, on Spoonies and other shorebirds? Um, do you have any thoughts on this, Thierry? Yes, thank you very much for the, for the questions. Yeah, in, in my experience in the Myanmar, we facing the thirst, especially the plastic pollution at the edge of the village and the coastal area. There is the indirect impact to the shopper species and other water species, water species in our country. I think that the plastic may be the, the area of their habitat and it, it can be the, especially for the not the, I mean that the, the water species, the plastic pollution is the mainly impact on the water species, not the fully impact on the, the very small water species like the spawn and sandpiper and other things at the Gulf of Modama. So, so in the, so we can do this pollution. We, we have made the, the awareness raising for above to reduce the pollution at the area. So we make the campaign, the awareness campaigns to the students, village, villagers, and the other, the fishermen and the, the, the local villagers in near around the area of the Gulf of Modama. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thierry. That was a good answer. Thank you. Yeah. And um, I will just proceed to our final question for the day. Um, I think this could be a general question that either Kim Mim or Thierry could take on. Um, I think uh, Jonathan uh, has a question on the carbon sequestration value of wetlands. Um, I think he's keen to know whether if the carbon sequestration value can help, you know, to raise the profile of wetlands in their conservation. Um, Kim Mim and Thierry, would you like to take on this question? Yes. Yep. May go I, for it. Okay. Uh, I, I want to say like this because around the coastal line, there are many movements related about the carbon sequestration activities, right? But uh, I can say like in terms of the carbon sequestration, it can be a good and the bad effect as well. For example, like because many projects, why I want to say this first, because sometimes when we're thinking about the carbon sequestration, they try to pick the fast growing species and use the coastal line to plant something. But anyway, in another side of that, we also it can be help in terms of the coastal prevention as well. And can, that's why I say it depends on which area. I know like in Thailand, they try to combine the con strawberry conservation with the carbon sequestration project. But anyway, now we try to find the balancing about the species composition and also try to make sure like we plant in the right place. This is a thing that I want to share with you guys. Maybe share with Thierry, maybe she has other thoughts of that. Any thoughts from Thierry? Yes, thank you very much. I think we have, um, the, in Myanmar, we have um, still not the experience about the carbon, carbon sequestration project at the wetland area. Sorry for that. Okay, no worries. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I think I think that's that's fine. Yeah, I think of course. Um, um, going forward, I think it's it's, it's uh, probably important for us to you know get a sense of how carbon is also being protected as we protect some of these key wetlands in Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam. So I think um, that will probably become a bigger part of our, our, our work going forward into the future. Yeah, I'm, I'm mindful that, you know, we, we've gone a bit over time and I know there are so many of these interesting questions that we wish we had more time to discuss. So um, I think uh, for those of these questions that can be easily answered, we'll just put it up in the, in the question and answer box. 
and I can see that uh, Thierry is already, uh, you know, uh, responding to one of these questions on spoonbill sandpipers. Uh, I'll probably chip in as well um, in, in, in a short bit. And I know there's another really good question that I think obviously will, will take up a quite a bit of discussion time. There's one really good question from a Sri Lankan colleague on how we can identify and protect Ramsar sites. And I hope you, you've got some ideas from Thierry's presentation on the work that they have done, you know, to secure such a huge area of Myanmar's coastal wetland as a Ramsar site. Um, thank you once again for uh, these really good questions uh, that got us thinking. Um, on this note, I will uh, I would like to you know conclude today's presentation by um, acknowledging um, not just um, uh, our donors who have obviously made a lot of this uh, work possible through their contributions and resourcing. Uh, but I would like to thank our two speakers, uh, uh, Kimim and Thierry, for making their time. It's really late in the day here in Asia already, in Thailand and Myanmar. So I really appreciate them taking time to join us despite all these challenges, to share their fantastic experiences, working on the ground with local communities especially. And, and many of you who have you know followed through our presentation will see that local communities and how we, we, we build this working relationship with them, uh, as well as with government authorities is a major part of the equation in you know having successful conservation initiatives here in Southeast Asia. So I hope that came through very clearly. Um, thank you once again, Thierry and, and, and Kimip. And of course, um, I also very much appreciate uh, Try for chipping in his presentation, despite him not being able to join us for today's session. Uh, thanks once again. And uh, I, I would like to t uh, now pass the floor to Sarah. Sarah is going to quickly run us through how you can support some of this work that BirdLife and the BirdLife partnership is doing in Asia. So uh, over to you, Sarah, to you know finish off the last bits of today's um, uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ding Li, and thank you everybody for such a uh, uh, great presentations today. Um, I you know we've seen a lot of great comments uh, in the box about how much people have enjoyed it and how interesting they found it. So that's fantastic. And thank you so much to everybody who's you just joined today. It's so important for us working in conservation, knowing that we've got you on our side, that you're part of the bird life family and that you really care about the conservation of the environment and the species. That makes a huge difference. Uh, so thank you very much for coming today. For those of you who have asked about the various links that uh, have been shared throughout the webinar, Today has been recorded, so um, hopefully it'll be on YouTube tomorrow, but if not, it will be on uh, on Monday. Um, and I will send a email around a little about that. So if you're on our mailing list, you'll get that. But if not, you can find it on the BirdLife International YouTube channel, which is under the Conservation Webinars playlist is where you'll find it. And in the description of that, we'll put all the links so you can find uh, all the various places that you'd like to go. Uh, and of course, you may or may not be aware that we are running an appeal at the minute to, uh, it's entitled Save Spoonie, so it's for the work that benefits uh, the Spoonbilled Sandpiper, which you heard all about today, but also benefits a huge amount of shorebirds uh, that live in Southeast Asia. Um, so if you do have some funds that you are willing to donate, uh, no matter how small, we'll be incredibly grateful. Uh, and you can do so at the link on your screen. It's birdlife.org. Uh, slash save spoonie um, and we would very much appreciate it if you um, give any donations towards that um, we have got just less than eight thousand pounds to go to meet our target and this appeal is running until the end of march um, so if you will help us meet that target so we can try and save these important species then that will be fantastic um, but uh, just one final thank you very much for me for coming and we hope to see you again. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. Thank you very much to Ding Lee for hosting this webinar so well. Um, and we hope you will enjoy the rest of your evenings, afternoons and mornings. Thanks for coming.